Hi everyone, welcome to the lost generation outside of the mainstream. My name is William Hooker. I am a musician, poet, and part of this generation of artists. My goal with this podcast, which is being broadcast on its own YouTube channel and my website, williamhooker.com, is to introduce you to many of the musical artists that are outside of the mainstream and have made important artistic contributions to our culture. I have also interviewed producers of the music and many fans and supporters of this work. My guests are sharing what makes this art form unique and significant. I hope these conversations will inspire you to listen to the music, which may change you and the way you view music, which again is outside of the mainstream. Today I am interviewing flautist band leader Cheryl Pyle. The interviews come out on the 1st and the 15th of each month. We are presenting these interviews, and we have so many amazing interviews coming up that you will be hearing in the future. This is The Lost Generation Outside of the Mainstream. This is a story that needs to be told. I'm really, really happy to be sitting here with Cheryl Pyle. Thanks, William. Loudest band leader composer. I've just witnessed a very, very nice concert. Thank you. And it's really an honor to have you here after such a long time and us uh, hooking, hooking back up again. Thank you, yeah. Um, would you tell us a little about yourself? I started playing flute in 1972 and uh, I was in college at the time and I, I thought, gee, I'm starting pretty late, but I really loved uh, playing flute. I had a great teacher, so I just went for it. I was practicing like all day, and uh, I started taking music classes, and I had a great teacher. And then I went up to UC Berkeley, which was a really traditional music department in San Francisco area, Berkeley, and um, got my bachelor's in music. And the great thing about that was, um, you know, I auditioned on Bach and Hindemith to get in the music department, but they had a great student activities big band. So there weren't a lot of sax players that could play flute very well, so I got to play all the big band flute parts, and I, and I worked with them with Dr. Tucker was the conductor at that time, and uh, Susan Muscarella was in the band. She runs the Jazz Conservatory now in Berkeley. So it was all that gang of people. And um, we did the Pacific Coast Jazz Festival with Freddie Hubbard and Sonny Rollins and Hubert Laws, all the CTI guys at the time. You know, it was in the 70s. And I had this part-time job uh, in San Francisco, which was right through the alleyway. It was on Green Street to Vallejo, right like directly near Keystone Corner. So every night, I worked there five nights a week waitressing, I would go through the alley in my little costume, because it was a musical, and I would stand in the doorway and listen to Dexter Gordon and Cecil Taylor and Earl Father Hines and Art Blakey and Woody Shaw and Horace Silver. I mean, it was just, I, I was like, oh my God, this is what I want to do. So um, I started meeting like a lot of the musicians and talking to them. And in 1980, um, through, through some of the guys with Horace Silver and, um, and Woody Shaw, um, they said, you should move to New York. Mm -hmm. So I packed up the cat and took a couple suitcases and I moved here. I didn't really have any money. I didn't really know anybody. I was just kind of let the music take me here. What year was that? 1980 in August. Okay. And w there was a, a woman here, uh, Chuck Metcalf's wife, uh, this bass player from San Francisco. And she had a loft on 14th Street and I ended up crashing with her. She took me around to all the jazz clubs, Bradley's, Fat Tuesdays. Um, Max was still at the Village Vanguard with his cigar. I met Max. He was like, did you find an apartment? Did you get a phone? Did you, you know, are you doing OK? He was always like, he let us, all of us in for free all the time, all the musicians, great, great. you know? Wow. Um, so she took me like from club to club. 
um, I met Fred Hirsch at Bradley's, okay. and uh, I ended up doing a, a little demo tape with him and Ron McClure and this drummer from um, from Scandinavia, who I've lost track of. But okay. anyway, we did we did uh, two tunes. We did this Al Foster tune, Pauletta, which is a really beautiful flute tune, and we did Monk's tune, Ask Me Now. And I took that around to get a gig, and okay. I got a gig at Jazz Forum, Mark Marginelli's Jazz sure. Forum, which was down on Broadway. And I got a gig, you know, at the Knitting Factory, and I got a gig at Jazzmania, and I, you know, I got a gig at Angry Squire, sure. and there was this place, Chin Chins, on Eighth Avenue by the bank. I played there with Andy Laverne and Ron McClure. I mean, you know, it was like a big scene at this <laughs> at that time. I mean, there right. were just like great jazz musicians yes. everywhere. Yes. And I was really trying to do like the straight ahead thing. So, um, you know, that all evolved over the 80s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I started doing my own quartet. Um, I ended up recording in the late 80s, not early 90s with um, Tom Harrell. So I did four CDs with him, with Charlie Hayden and Paul Motion and Joe Lobano. And Danilo Perez was just here. He was 23 years old. He, he was just on the first on the scene. So we did um, some CDs, and then I just went ahead and did my own record company because I couldn't really get anybody to let me record. Yes. So we recorded in my drummer's uh, basement. Why do you think that was? Well, I think because, you know, it's like I was very naive, I think, coming here and thinking, wow, I love Art Blakey so much, I know I can like play that stuff, you know, like be in his band. He never had a woman in the band, and I love him so much, you know. But there were no women in, in those bands that took the younger musicians and and taught them. Interesting. You know, that, that like mentored them. Yes. There was nobody mentoring That's me. That's the word I was thinking. There was nobody mentoring me. So I just said, well, I'm going to mentor myself. So, you know, I did my own record company. We recorded in the drummer's basement. His roommate mixed it. We printed it down at Europa Disc on Varick Street. Sure. We took the boxes of CDs when they were done over to Qualiton in Long Island City and I got a distributor and I distributed to them nationwide and I did all this myself and That's I had incredible. no idea like what I was doing. Right. I was working part time at Tower Records at the time so I got them in Tower Records on, cons he, on oh, consignment on, on, on Broadway, 4th Broadway, and Broadway. Yes. Uh -huh. And so I worked in the classical department there and I was just you know hearing a lot of great music and playing yeah. little gigs and um, and then Tower closed in 2016, okay. you know, and I thought I would just kind of keep that part-time job. It was great, you know, balance for a musician uh -huh. um, to hear music at work, you know, yes, yes. even though it was a job just oh. for money. <laughs> you know, it was like I was connected to the music still. But when they went bankrupt, it was really, really hard. I was in my late 50s, and I couldn't find a job, and then I got skin cancer on my lip. I see. And so I had to have this major surgery, and I got home, and I looked at my lip, and I was like, oh, man, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to be, be able to play flute anymore. So I just was so upset that I recorded a CD at home. I had this digital recorder, right. and I, I had been playing bass for a while with this rock band, so I played, like, these you know, little jazz bass lines that you know, I'm not really a jazz bass player, I but I played, I, I played what I could because I composed, you know, so I, I laid down the bass line and I took the flute solos and this was like with stitches in my lip, okay. you know, okay. and it was just, right. you know, I just plowed ahead and got that out and, and then when I wanted to try my embouchure, um, my other flute friend, Nick Gianni, said, well, there's this place, ABC No Rio, why don't you come down, we'll play a set, right. and we'll just play like, you know, a short, like, free improvisation, you can try out your embouchure, because, you know, with flute, you use all these muscles, it's like really a major thing when you cut into that, okay. you know, so okay. that, like, was so, yeah. like, scary. So I played flute duos down with Nick, and then I started going to ABC No Rio, and I just loved it, it was so... Like the free jazz, free improvisation was so um, spiritual for me because I'd already been playing flute for so many years that, yes. that I had this like bebop, classical, Latin knowledge <laughs> yeah. to like now I could 
sound like me. Yes. You know, I could like tap into where I was coming from, uh -huh. you know. And so then Burn Nick started showing up at my little concerts down there, and we started playing, and the Beyond group started with him, and uh, and then about four or five years ago, this all women free jazz group. Right, right. Because right. you know people talk about well, there's it's a problem. Yeah, it's a problem, but I mean I never well, thought. What's a problem? It, it, you know, being accepted. No matter who you are, you have struggles like being accepted. Okay. However, you're playing. Yeah. So I said, well, instead of like complaining, because I never thought of myself as a female musician, I just thought of myself as a musician. Great, beautiful. You know, beautiful. I thought, well, you know, there aren't that many free jazz all women groups. I'm going to start one. Okay. So I called these all these women that play, and they wanted to play, and it's just that's how it grew into, you know, what it is today. So, you know, I'm hoping that 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 vibe, just. Um, you know, I just like to try things. I like to play with different people. Right. I'm not in any clique. I'm not, I don't belong to any, you know. I understand. Click is a word. I mean, I just, you know, I, I wanted to play with the bebop guys. I mean, Tom Harrell and Joe Lovano are some of the greatest musicians I ever met. And Charlie Hayden and Paul Motion, when I soloed, they took my flute and they, I literally, at that session, and I was 38 years old when we did that session, they raised me out of my little booth chair. I mean, I was just like, they were so in tune. They listened so hard. They were just such great musicians. So, you know, I just, I would think like when I'm composing, I'm, gee, I'd like to hear that person play that. And I would just call them to play a gig uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and just try it, you know? Yeah. So I think that you grow from that, from trying to play with different people, not just sticking with like the same people all the time. That's beautiful. I mean, so what, you, what you've just <laughs> expressed is such a, no, it's such a, it's such a uh, story. And to me, that's the kind of stories we want to tell. Thank you. Um, the purpose of The Lost Generation is to actually bring in and speak about those people that we know that have made uh, contributions outside of the mainstream. And, uh, and, and many of them have passed away. Right. And briefly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you one specific question. You can take it anywhere you want it. Because as I was coming down here, I was wondering, I was saying, hmm, should I ask Cheryl anything about being a female musician? And um, it came to me that I know you just want to be called a musician. I know that. You know, and, and uh, but then I, I I remembered that in some of the uh, uh, interviews I've done, it actually it we actually spoke about race. We spoke about that, right? And that's not exactly what no, I, but that there's, wasn't my goal. But there's a big connection because you know we're like second, third world people. So I'll I take mean, this women into, aren't I'll, aren't really respected, and black well, people aren't really this. respected. You know, this. I will use this to make the questions because. Then I, I will know that you'll know you you understand that I'm not just asking this question out of the fact that I want a, a I want to interview a female musician. Well, I have a story too. You understand. I don't know if you ever met C Sharp, that saxophone player. He was around the East Village in the early '80s, but I went to this session with him in Brooklyn, and it was all guys. Well, tell me one thing. And you know, I was so nervous, and I thought, well. All I can do is just be the best musician I can be. And so they were all like, oh, yeah, this girl, you know. <laughs> but, but, after, girl. but after I played, we were, right. all, we were all cool. We were all friends. We were well, what all, I'm going we to were, ask you. It, and that's, that's the most important thing. Is what I'm that, going to be asking you is about people's music. Okay. I'm not interested about their personalities. I'm not interested if, if they're... Terrible people, nice people. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you, after I ask you this question, I'll give you certain people, and I want you to really go inside of yourself and tell me about their music, if, if you know them. And, and that's, that, because that's the main goal of this. Okay. Because as you know, you know, um, I think uh, that's, that's, the, that's the train I've been, I've been on. I really want people to understand their uh, their expertise in music and how that's important, separate from 
all this other stuff well, that I, people are interested in. Well, the weird thing in. too, William, is that for influences for me were trumpet players. Well, we'll talk about you that. You know? My question, though. Instead of flute players. My question to you is, <laughs> how do you think the flute fits into the tradition of free jazz experimental music? Well, one of the first groups I was listening to was Henry Threadgill's AIR in the 70s. And I mean, his flute playing was just so amazing. And I mean, of course, everyone talks about Eric Dolphy. I mean, he just influenced every flute player still playing today. But I mean, there was there was also, you know, Hubert Laws, who is more tonal, and you know, Dave Valentine, and you know, so many great flute players. Um, but I just I don't know I don't know what to say. I mean, I just tried to listen as much as I could, and and when they would play some amazing like a little idea or lick that I liked, I would write it down. So I have this whole book of like things I practice and all the keys that are mm -hmm. that are things people played, things Lee Morgan played, things Charlie Parker played, things, you know, Henry Threadgill played. And it might just be like one little measure or you know, and that's my practice book. And I still use that today. Well how does that fit into because basically what I see a lot of is Horn players that play reed, saxophone, and they play flute on the side. Oh, yeah. That's a, it's, that's a subsidiary instrument. It's not really. I'm asking you about flute as a primary instrument in terms of where it is with free jazz and experimental. And I don't mean like people that play tenor first and then all of a sudden they switch off. Well, that's, that's yeah, people about. always said that to me in college. They're like, you should play saxophone, and I'm like, well, I don't want to. I just want to be a flute player. Okay. I mean, it's kind of considered an extra instrument, or you know, that sax and trumpet are like the main instruments, and flutes kind of, uh, it's just for like a ballad or some like extra thing over there, you know. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. So. But that's not the way you look at I it. I don't look at it that way. Um, it's it's like a major thing for me, and I try to either compose music for that sound or put groups together with like incorporating that sound. Uh -huh. um, I think some people, you know, have done, have tried to do that, but it's still kind of considered an, an extra instrument on the outskirts of, of both tonal and free jazz. Okay, you know? but, but, you, but you don't believe that. No, I don't. So think. What, I'm, what I'm interested <laughs> in your, I'm interested in the Cheryl, the Cheryl Pyle belief. Why, what is it about the timbre and what is it about the free jazz that makes you sure about the fact that you play flute and well, that's what you do? There, there's a possibility for all kinds of different sounds. I mean, with the open keys, you can get quarter tones. Um, with the trill keys, you can get all kinds of weird sounds. You can do flutter tonguing. Um, now everybody's playing alto and bass flute and contrabass flute. I just saw uh, Claire Chase do a concert. She has this huge flute that's like six feet tall that's really low, you know, it's like a super low sound. Um, it's also, there's, there's a lot of mobility on it with the keys. I mean, it's very melodic and you can move around. I mean, you can do all kinds of wide intervals. You can. Um, you can play beautiful melodies and you can also use like your voice, you know, you can make all kinds of weird sounds too. So it can be very experimental as, as well as melodic. So I like that, that whole combination. You know, it's like there's a lot you can do with the flute just besides playing like a, a good tone, you know, which I worked on a long time. <laughs> but, yeah, but Cheryl, this is, what I, this is what I'm probing. This is where I want this to go and you just really you just enlightened me about what the flute is because I don't think I've heard it that much from a person like yourself. Um, Kelly Festo. She's a flute player. She has like a wide collection of like all kinds of flutes, wood flutes, silver flutes. Um, she did a lot of experimental music and actually I met her when we did the Dissident Arts Festival uptown. I met her. Yeah, so um, she's another flute. What do you think about her playing? 
I mean, actually have never I've there. never heard her play live. You've never heard her play live. Yeah, I've never heard her play live, so I, I don't know what to say, but okay. I did meet her a couple years ago. All right. Um, Karen Borka. I don't know her. Okay. Um, Toby Casavan. Wow. Um, I'm going to name a lot, a lot of people here, well, and if you don't know them, that's all right, because yeah, I'm kind then of, you're going to tell me the people that you do know. I, I'm that. kind of like in my own little world. Marty I'm not Ehrlich. like on the scene. I'm not, Okay. I'm, I'm just, you know, I don't really. You don't listen to other people's music that I much? I do, but um, I got to the point where I just wanted to focus on what I was hearing, and I just, and I kind of like became a hermit, and I didn't want to, you know, um, be influenced by what was going on. What are you hearing? Um, well, like today, I'm hearing like a lot of the things Byrne and I played. They're they're melodic ideas, but they're very abstract. They're very disjunct. They're very free um, around some kind of tonal centers, mm -hmm. but not really. But um, but always like first with the melody in mind and then and then second listening to what other people are playing and responding to that so that's what I've been trying to work on the past few years and um, I used to go out every night and hear jazz in the early 80s and 90s and I just completely stopped so um, not only from being really tired all the time um, and older but just also that I wanted, like my voice to come through, clearer. I so um, I don't. I mean, I love like a lot of other musicians playing, and I follow them, and I want to go, but I just I don't really uh, have a critique on, you know, people on the scene. I just don't really have it. <laughs> then what makes you? Then what? Well, let me ask you a question. That's good. That's good. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out if you. What is it about other musicians that attracts you to them? Is it their music or is it their personality? Um, or is it, you know, is it because like somebody in Downbeat said, this person is great? No, I don't. Oh, I know, stopped, you, know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, right? I, I stopped reading Downbeat, I think, in the oh, 70s. No. Whatever. You know? I mean, it could be Downbeat, could be The Wire, yeah. it could be Coda, it yeah. could be anything. I mean, but what is what is what draws you to whoever? What drew you, what drew you to Byrne, for example? Well, he he was he was very um, he was very intelligent. He was very peaceful. He he would just come and listen, and so you know we started talking. And um, he's a very intelligent, thoughtful person, you know. And I think that came out in his playing. Um, I mean, people were always, he told me people would always ask him about harm melodics and he would be like, I don't know. So I wrote this tune for him, uh, Harm Melodics Anonymous and the Twelve Tone Truth, because he said we belong to Harm Melodics Anonymous. I mean, we're just, I don't know, you know, where, where I fit in. I'm just trying to play what my voice is now in my older I years I and I, I can't I just don't even think about like all the whatever else is going on at the moment oh all right then. okay no no <laughs> so it's kind of uh, it's it. kind of um um I kind of really hermitized in the well, past let me ask few you years about the people. I think the cancer was was a part of that too well, let me ask you about the people that you chose to put in your group that I just heard. Well, I met I met Judy uh, in the early '80s when she was a dancer, and before she was even singing. But is she of our generation? Yeah, she's she's near my age, and I mean, I met Joe because he was on the scene back well, in the '80s. Tell me about Judy specifically. Tell me about Judy's Judy's approach to music and her music as a vocalist. In your, in your well, I wrote I wrote a lot of lyrics for jazz singers because I I admit I met Fred Hirsch when I first moved here, and um, that first gig I had at the Jazz Forum was with Fred Hirsch and Ron McClure and Billy Hart, and I wanted to work on some of Fred's tunes because they were so melodic and beautiful for flute, and I started hearing these words and I'd written some lyrics in California, but it became like a major thing here. So um, 
Fred recorded some of those. And with Judy? Yeah, no, with um, oh, I'm, with, I'm about Judy with Janice that. Siegel. But then, yeah. but then, I also wrote tune uh, lyrics for just about all of Tom Harrell's tunes in the '80s and '90s. Um, so Judy sang one of those, and yeah. it was a recording that Joe was doing. What was the name of it? Um, I, I can't remember the recording, but the tune was I Don't Know. And it was some words I wrote actually about Tom's apartment. <laughs> but it was like very, you know, image like words. But she sang that, and then I kind of lost touch with her, but she started doing like free improvisation. And she was doing that with Joe. And, it, and then, like, after 2010, uh, I, I was doing it. So we kind of reconnected because great, of that. Great. But it was uh -huh. after, like, a, many years. You know, okay. Of now not I can being remember. In touch. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm a, on the right on the right path with this one, but for some reason I get a feeling I equate you with Blaze Sawula. Yeah. Well, I I used to go to ABC No Rio every Sunday can you after tell me the cancer. About this? Can you tell me about something? Blaze like Blaze is great. I well, I first went to the Yippee Yuppie thing that was on Bleecker. There was a a Yuppie club and they had jazz there and his group was playing with his daughter robin was playing viola and a bunch of people so i went and um and then i started going to abc no rio he puts together great groups i mean he's just um he's such a creative person and and to organize all of us you know he'd organize these great festivals and we'd all play like 15 minutes Vern and i played the last one actually at abc no rio and um He's just, um, he's all about the music. What can you say a little bit deeper about his music? Um, I, I know him as a person who, who plays alto and he has a vibrato to his playing. I don't know, I don't, I don't really, I'm kind of, when I listen to people, I just accept how their, their idea of jazz is coming out. Okay. So I don't know if it's right or wrong, it's just the way they play. And that's they what, are, and that's one thing. Them. Yeah. yeah well, so. hopefully, that's what we're trying to reach for, okay. you know. And so that's what I try and um, accept is that, you know, none of us are going to sound alike. I don't think we should be trying to sound alike. I mean, if if okay. we're trying to sound alike, we could do, you know, Charlie Parker tunes. We could play exactly like him. But we're not trying to do that. We're trying to play this like whatever um, is inside us well, what to come out. What distinguishes Blaze from um, Danny Carter? Well, Daniel is, is a whole uh, astral, spiritual entity in himself. I mean, I played a lot with Daniel down uh, at um, Downtown Music, and with Claire we did a group. Daniel Carter is just he can just play one note and the whole universe is in that note. It's just has, it's his whole spirit is just such a wonderful spirit, you know, and he's such a great musician. I mean, I think it comes, I don't know, from whatever experiences you've gone through and, and how long you've lived. I mean, there are a lot of these, like, older musicians. I mean, like, I learned so much from Byrne and, and from Daniel and these older musicians that I get to play with. And a lot of those guys, you know, are, are dying now, you know, because they're a little bit older than me. That's why I'm doing this. Yeah, it's just... One reason. Yeah, it's great that um, to hopefully have the younger people connect with some of these older musicians and, like, get to play with them and learn from them because they have a vast... Like, Daniel has a vast storehouse of things he draws from. I mean, every gig is, like, such an exploration. It's just a That's wonderful... Right. You know, and, and Blaze is like that too. He's been playing for I don't know how many years. I mean, it's That's just right. these guys have been playing forever. You know, yeah. so it just um, one thing when Judy and I did the Dissonant Arts Fest, um, Joe said something like that about our set. It was just like, you know what to do now. It's just from those year, all those years of playing, in all those different settings, and all those different recordings and all those different compositions you try to write and all those fragments you saved. Yes. It's just, you know, hopefully in your older years you'll be able to manifest some musical wisdom <laughs> that comes out that speaks to other people, you know. Right. And that's the whole um, joy of, I think, free improvisation is that, that 
that love of it What would you like out. to say to young women that would like to become um, musicians in the free jazz experimental scene? Well, I would say just uh, be, be brave and um, play with... Why brave? Because I just remember um, playing at some of the first loft sessions in San Francisco when I had no idea what I was doing. You know, just like the first sessions I ever went to were these loft jazz sessions at this church in San Francisco. And there's a big loft jazz scene there in the 70s. These guys, you know, were like free jazz, you know, geniuses. And so <laughs> I would just go and I would think, I really have a lot of nerve, like even standing up here trying to play, but I just kept doing it. And I'm sure it sounded just awful in the beginning. You know, I, I don't have any recordings of that, luckily. But, okay, okay. <laughs> but I would say right. just be brave, you know, play with a lot of different people. Um, play with people that are playing something that you hear that, that you like, you know, try and emulate that. Tr try and save the, like, all the fragments and ideas because you can always, you know, go back to them and maybe write a tune from that or, you know, expand on it with some other way in some yes. group that you're doing. Um, I just say, like, practice every day, which I do, um, and do not be limited to that if you want to, say, call yourself a free jazz musician, I mean, you can play... Um, you, you can play Handel, you can play Bach, you, yes. you can play Hindemith, right. you can play, you know, all this like experimental 20th century classical composers. Sure. You can play, um, like I was really influenced by, you know, listening to Lee Morgan. I love like listening to Woody Shaw, you know, those like lines. You don't have to just listen to flute. You don't have to just be locked into flute. You can you know, listen to guitar player solos, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I, I absolutely uh, loved Miles Davis because I thought his playing was architectural, you know, I thought he would, it was like kind of disjointed later, but, but he was really into art and painting, so I think that influenced like his lines, you know, it's like just work on lines and just practice like as much as you can, you know, that's, and I think the main thing is to, you know, everybody gets locked into, well, I'm this, or well, I'm that, or well, I'm a woman, or well, I'm, I'm not. Just think of yourself as a creative being and try and tap into that instead of locking yourself into some whatever society says you're supposed to be. Because it's done that to all of us, you know? It said, you know, you have to act a certain way and I have to act a certain way, but you can be just as strong as, as a guy or you can be, you know, just as, I don't know, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, I'm with you. You know, you, Cheryl, you don't have to, Cheryl, like, fit into a mold. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this, thank you thank for you. this amount of time we spent together. <laughs> After such Take a, a long time. <laughs> Wow. Cave Conum in oh, the eighties. Wow, 80s. <laughs> this is such an incredible thing. <laughs> really. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for tuning in. In months ahead, you will have the opportunity to hear from many more Lost Generation artists and supporters. The audio only version is available wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to hear upcoming episodes.